Questioner, who's here as a questioner? No one is here as a questioner. We have a small house today. Uh, I hope people didn't leave because they couldn't get access to the room. Okay, so uh, Yesha, Gary, Vikash, Nick, and Huang will be presenting uh, on machine translation sequence to sequence and attention. So uh, let's give them a round of applause and uh, let's get started. Thank you. Hi, good evening everyone. My name is Yasha and today we will be talking about machine machine translation, sequence to sequence and attention. So I will quickly just go through introduction to machine translation, the evolution uh, and uh, then after that, I'll pass on my time to Gary, who will talk about statistic uh, machine translation. And then Vikash will be talking about neural machine translation and sequence to sequence architecture. And then Nick will carry on with uh, attention, and Huang will close our presentation with uh, different applications of, se of sequence to sequence and uh, attention. So let me start off with a brief history of machine translation. Uh, so it dates back to as late as 1920s. So between 1920s and 1950s, there were a few early experiments being conducted. The first known machine translation proposal was made uh, in 1924 in Estonia, which was more like a typewriter kind of a machine translator. Um, the more well-known one is this one. Uh, in 1933, a French-Armenian inventor called uh, Arstroni uh, received a patent for a mechanical machine translator which looked something like this. So basically it's just um, you can clean something and you'll get a value for it. So there are many more applications of this translator other than just translation. So it could be used as a phone directory, etc, etc. So this guy is probably like some, um, one of the first people who came up with the idea of some sort of a key value pair and database, I feel. Um, so moving on, um, from then to 1946, there were a lot of people who made proposals. And there's this Russian scholar who came up, uh, with, uh, came up uh, with the first mechanized dictionary. And um, in Britain, there were two scientists, scholars, Booth and Richards, who did a, automated, uh, a demo on automated dictionary. And after that, in 1949, there's um, uh, this uh, researcher called Warren Weaver who wrote a memorandum. And this was the first mention of uh, using digital computers to translate documents between different natural human languages. So this is like the first official start of machine translation. So from then on, uh, there were different uh, research uh, experiments being conducted and in IBM, uh, in 1954, IBM and Georgetown University uh, conducted a public demo that involved uh, the first direct translation systems and uh, the pair of languages they used was Russian to English. So this was just right after the World War II and uh, what they did was they were using um, a very small set of grammar rules and, um, wait, yeah. And, and the scope was very limited in terms of what was being translated. So it was a direct translation system where the SL, the source language, was Russian and the TL, the, the target language, was English. Um, so after that, um, the research continued and people realized that there was very little involvement from the linguistic side of things. It was really just a rule-based thing. So uh, as research continued, there, were better, there was a better understanding of linguistics and more indirect approaches in, introduced into the system. And uh, there we started coming up with different rule-based translation systems, one of them being interlingual machine translation. So the process looks something like this. Uh, there's always the, the, the text is converted into a representation which is independent of any language before it is converted into the target language. And after that, um, 
there's uh, transfer machine learning. So this is very similar to inter interlingual one, except there's a set of transfer rules which are language based that are introduced in between. And um, after that, we move on to modern machine translation, which uh, involves other different types of machine translation, such as statistical machine translation, example-based machine translation, and neuro neural machine translation. Uh, so now I'll pass on my time to Gary, who will elaborate more on statistical machine translation. Thank you. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gary, and today I'll be presenting the topic on statistical machine translation, or SMT for short. So SMT has been around for quite some time, like since about 1990s, and it has been since the day of the art for until like, like 2010 or so. And it has been worked on um, by large corporations, most notably IBM. So you can imagine how much time was being done over the course of 20, 30 years that people have worked on this uh, SMT. So the amount of content is so huge that I probably could, uh, it's impossible to cover everything in one session like this. But I will try my best to summarize what I've learned so, uh, so far about SMT. Uh, one might ask why, why are we looking at SMT since we all know that uh, neural machine translation is now then the, the de facto state of the art at present. But I think it's a good idea to understand how machine translation was done prior to that. And maybe perhaps also understand uh, like the shortcomings of SMT so that we can better appreciate how neural machine translation has come to uh, like solve these short shortcomings. So the basic approach uh, for SMT is that uh, given a source text in uh, notation F, stands for foreign language, we are supposed to find the target text uh, E. Where we take it as English. Right? And then they model the SMT using a probabilistic approach, right? So here, uh, the hand, left hand side is the English text that you want to find, right? And then you find among all the possible um, like uh, uh, English text that you can as uh, candidates, given the foreign text, and then you, you find the maximum of this function, the probability. So you you can think of it like the multiple candidates of English text. Uh, given a foreign text, and you want to find the one with the highest probability, they give you the best fit to describe uh, what, what you want. And what people usually do in, for SMT is that they further decompose this function into two parts via the base rule. Right? So if you can see the base rule, um, the denominator P of F here um, is not present in the final decomposition because we are taking the argument of max of E, which now then makes the denominator a constant, which then can be ignored. And so far, we can just look at the numerator. And intuitively, you can uh, understand that, that this part of the function is two parts, two models, P F given E and P of E. Right? So the first one is the translation model, second one is the language model. And you can think of it like the translation model takes care of the function of modeling the correctness of the translation. Right? Given uh, in this text, you're um, supposed to find the probability of all foreign texts. And uh, on the other hand, PE, which is called the language model, models the fluency of the target language of English. We should be quite familiar by everyone here because we have already covered language models in week 5. Right. Um, so for this SMT, usually each component is trained independently uh, using different data sets. So one quick question here is, um, what you might ask is that, why do we decompose this function into two, two functions here? Why not just directly model, like train one model on the left hand side? Would anyone to try to give a, a, a hand to answer and explain this technique? I'm not too sure whether many people recognize this formation. It's, this process is also known as the noisy channel approach, which is commonly used in information theory. It has been applied to many applications like speech recognition and handwriting recognition. So the, the reasons are largely similar. So I, if I can just... Anyone want to try? Yeah. 
I think I think I can agree with you. Uh, I think it's also with regard to data availability. Like um, we can simply say for sure that there are a lot more data that we can use to train the language model, mm -hmm. and there are very very few data that are known as parallel corpora, which has both direct translation, uh, correct translation for the text. So as you all know, the data can be quite noisy. So perhaps if you train that model directly from the land side like this. Um, it, it's going to have a lot of sparse data and it's going to be difficult to train. Uh, the noise will be very, very sensitive to the performance. So therefore, um, people will generally tend to model the data into two parts like this. And then we can be more sloppy in the way we train for them. In the way that if there are some errors in one model, the other models can help to support them by, by readjusting them the uh, so that you can eventually still choose the final optimal E of the target package. Also, in many cases, that you can diagnose errors better when you factor things out. So, for example, when you have a translation error, it's pretty, pretty apparent that your vocabulary is missing things. Right? Um, and that uh, when, when you see a translation that has all the semantic units there, but maybe it doesn't quite do it, then it's a uh, uh, fault of the language model. Right? Uh, and uh, there are lots of cases in which you can um, look at a translation Yes. Because we are taking the argument of uh, I I can't match over e, and because um, e is not part of the function here, so it becomes a constant. So it's like directly proportional to that model. So we can omit that it doesn't help in the model part. Yeah, I'd like to explain it another way. This is another question that I ask my machine learning class. Why isn't there the probability? Of that? Right. So the reason why is because F is given to you, right? You're supposed to translate a particular French sentence into English, right? You don't get to choose which sentence you want to translate. You can say, well, you gave me this sentence, but I prefer to translate this other sentence, so I'm going to give you that translation, right? You, you're getting the F as an input, okay? So you don't get to choose your F. So it, it becomes a normalization factor. You can just put it so that's another way to think about it. You're, you're given the F, so now you, you don't have any choice because if you look on the left hand side of the equation, it says given F, right? So uh, even though the probability of, say, some, some, some French sentence might be very small, you don't have a choice. Right? So that's a good question. All right, I, I shall move on. Okay. So um, during the course of preparing the slides, I also came to learn about um, a more general formulation to the one that we've seen earlier. So I think we call this model called log linear model, where we can actually allow for um, additional components to be included in the model. Right. So some of the models that I, I read about, um, like, so just now we have two models, right? Translation model and the language model. So you can you can actually add more models that you want, and such of these models may include like the length of sentence. Uh, additional language models, uh, external lexicons that you might want to refer to, and uh, of, of more like complex 
uh, dependencies like synthetic dependencies like grammar based uh, knowledge and so on. Right? And um, you can also add different weights to each model to how you have one uh, when you see them as more important to how you finally finally come up with the optimal E that you want. And um, so if you just choose F1 to be the transition model and F2 to be the language model, and we assign the weights to be equal, and then it just falls back to the earlier case that you see right now. Right? So this is just a more general form. And the part that I want, the reason why I show you this is because I, I want you to understand that these models can get pretty much quite complex. And there's a lot of human um, like feature engineering involved here. You want to, to create the best SMP uh, that are considered a state of the art here. Um, but then, um, because the, the focus of this course is about deep learning for an LP, right? so I should not go much deeper in here. I'll just go on to the next part. Yeah, so this is an intuition um, example that I like to give uh, for the transition model and the negative model. So we want to choose a, a candidate choice here. So this is all the candidates we might have for the transition French sentence over here. And then you want to choose one that has high scores for both models here. Right, so the first model uh, basically tries to translate the semantic meaning of the transition. So of, of all these choices, four of them roughly got the same meaning. But the, the English here sounds weird. It doesn't sound correct. And that is taken care of by the second model, the language model. So in this case, uh, you would probably want to choose the green one here and not the red one. Uh, to put it as a big picture, so this is how SNT works. Um, you have the transition model, which is trained on the parallel corpora. Uh, these paracopular uh, corporal data sets are usually uh, used from United Nations conventions, like they have the five official languages, so they have transcribed all the translations of all the conventions according. And, um, yeah. and the language model is trained on monolingual corporal. Right? And these two will then act as input to the decoding algorithm, which actually acts as just like a search problem, where they search, uh, like find the best candidates among, among what was given by these two models, and then select the best one. So this is where we done do the up next function here. Okay. You guys know what uh, process is the most well translated process in most languages? Can you have to guess? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's been tested in so many different languages. So a lot of people are using that. All right, so we have already covered language models, so I'll just do a very quick recap here. So basically, the most common language model that we all know is uh, n grad model. All right, so basically, uh, you can decompose the probability of E into a sequence of tokens, and uh, you can further break them down via chain rule, use the Markov assumption that the probability of the word is only dependent on the n number of words behind it. And then you can use the maximum likelihood estimation by using the counts to sort of estimate the likelihood of words or phrases based on the frequency found in large corpus. Right? And of course, we also use uh, extensions of smoothing and backcross. Okay, now, it's the tricky part. The part that is difficult is the transition model. So this transition model, actually, what it does is that it learns the lexical ma mapping between languages and as well as the ordering. Uh, what, why do I learn? Uh, I will explain that in a moment. So, we also typically focus on word level or phrase level mapping. So this is very, very similar to how n grams work as well. Because it's, it, it's impossible to learn the entire, uh, like, we, we don't do sentence gram, right? We do n grams, we break down a sentence into smaller chunks of words and phrases and so on. Yeah. So we, we adopt the same approach here for translation models. Because it's, uh, there's just two, two insufficient data to learn entire sentence mapping directly. All right? So we are looking at something like you think of it like a translation table, probability probability table, where given an English, uh, you want to predict the foreign language, and you have this given uh, like probab probabilities here, all right? And they are, you can also look at it like uh, lexical mapping between languages. So basically, the top one is the English given English, and this is the foreign language translation, and you want to map them by drawing lines to denote that this word uh, is mapped to this word, and so on, right? So the problem here is that um, given a parallel corpora, all right, we do not have this nor this information. Right? Um, both of them are unknown. But if you know one of them, okay, we, can, we can sort of deduce and estimate the other quite easily. Right? If you given the table, 
we can easily extract the mapping out by just looking at the distances between how these words occur uh, right, uh, from the target and the source. And vice versa, if we, will, we know the mapping, we can also estimate the translation table probabilities by just counting the number of lines for each unit pair. All right? So um, there are a few models that are approached to solve this problem, which I will touch more upon later. But before that, I would like to formal, formalize this term known as word alignments, which was pretty much the main, um, like one of the things that you need to understand before we understand how we approach the model, transition model. Right. So the first thing they do here is they assume that every sentence is aligned. So it means to say one sentence mapped to one sentence. Right? You, of course, there are other cases whereby they, they break down one sentence into multiple sentences, yeah, but we should not. Uh, we, we, we just assume that now the centers are all aligned, one to one mapping, right? And um, this is the transition model that we are we want to find out, right? So what they did is that they further break it out into smaller components, and they introduce this notion known, known as A, which stands for alignment, all right? So given an example here, right? This is English text. This is um, I forgot the language here. <laughs> it's Spanish or something. Right. So basically, you want to map. Um, uh, you want to know the mapping from J to I here, okay? And so the A, you can just take it as a vector okay, of the a foreign language here, of each of the token in the foreign language, will be assigned an uh, index, which represents how this word is mapped to the English words, all right? So for the index, if it's zero here, it means that it's a noun, meaning, uh, for example, this case here, A, which is somewhat like a special modifier for that specific language, may not have any mapping at all. So this, in this case, it will be assigned as zero. And as you can see, there might be many, many types of mappings available. You can see one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, you can have one-to-many, many-to-one, and many-to-many. -many, right? So you can get pretty complex. So um, just a quick question here. Would anyone want to try you know, to answer how many possible alignments are there? Like given this example, maybe there are L number of words in E and N number of words in F. Okay. Anyone want to try to estimate the number of alignments, possible alignments I think? Well, you can think of it like this is the final output that you want to get, right? So, yeah, what's the length of the vector? As an alignment vector? In this case, is I, think, I don't think it's that bad. So you think of it like this yellow vector here, right? Okay, yeah, sorry. N raised to N. M. Yeah, 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 yeah correct. I think you, you roughly got the, the right answer. So the correct answer is actually 1 plus L bracket raised to N. Yeah, correct, because there should be zero here, we, we need to plus one, because it's possible that the number, that the index value here could be one, could be zero, which is now. Right, so it's L plus one raised to the power of n, because there are n number of uh, elements in this vector. Right. So it's not vectorial, but it's I would say polynomial with power n, so it's not that bad. Okay, so um, now that we understand the, the notations that were used in um, word alignments, um, so I'll be explaining to you a few models. 
uh, like no IBM models in general. So the I, the models are named after IBM, I suppose, because they were the main uh, like researchers that were that were that have came up with these models to help to cope with computer models. And in general, their models um, are usually characterized characterized by these four parameters. So they are key, which uh, which is like lexical translation. So this is something similar to what I've shown earlier, like the translation table. Just that this is uh, we're looking at per word level, like probability of uh, that x translates to y, and uh, n for fertility. Uh, probably is the probability that x may produce uh, like more words. In this case, uh, probability that x produce three more, three more words. The third one is distortion, which is the arrangement of words, because you notice that the alignment also concerns about the arrangement of, of how the words may, may be. All right, so D, D takes care of that part. And the last and foremost is P1, which is probably the X is generated from nothing. And now, I think it's easier to explain this using a diagram. So like, for example, given a foreign language here, um, the fertility part, like, for example, this word has very high probability that it may produce three, words, three more words. So in this case, after this step, it may, produce, it may repeat itself three more times. Uh, for this word, it's probably a high probability that it produces nothing at all. So it's being ignored in this step. And then the translation part, you see, just maps the table to the corresponding lexical mapping. And then the insertion part, um, you see, insert additional words from now. Right? And then the distortion part takes care of the arrangement. Okay. So, um, there are many, many models. Um, they are usually uh, they are called IBM 1 and 2, 5. I think I've also read IBM 6 and so, so on, but I didn't really get that far. Um, so, as you can imagine, that like, you can get a lot, lot more complex over here as you can get add in more human like hand design features as you go on. And um, for this session, I'll probably just explain IBM 1, which is the simplest model of all. So, the IBM model, if you do any like the, the backbone of the folks at IBM and people walking lab, they, they held the field for over 30 years. Everyone was talking about model one, two, three. So um, you know this, uh, even if I have to go into the middle of the day, everyone still got the field. So, yeah. so mm -hmm. I'll just be briefly introducing to you uh, IBM one, right? So just in the, in the most simplest case, where they just uh, take one parameter, which is the, the lexical translation parameter T, the first one that I, I showed you earlier. And this is the final model. So, right? so as you can see here, the, the denominator here is the number of combination of alignments that you get. Right? And epsilon is the normalizing constant. We need this constant here because, after all, this is the probability function, which uh, needs to have the values to be in a range of 0 and 1. So this concern is, is needed here to make it a uh, probability function. Right. So for example, given this text, uh, English to French, um, we have initially L equal 8 and N equal 10. Uh, so this is how you, you calculate the probability function of F A given E uh, like this. Okay. So if you can uh, imagine a uh, Y there is a denominator, denominator here, a uh, one uh, which is the total number of alignments possible, because uh, this is after all a probability function based on a, right? So there, there you need to account for for one plus l power n number of uh, alignments possible. So here they just merely de uh, use it as a de denominator here, because after all at the end of it you have to sum it up among all possible alignments to get the final uh, p like, e of f. Uh, F, F given it. Right. Okay. And um, so the next question here is how can we estimate these parameters in the model? Right? So uh, remember, remember the earlier problem that I mentioned earlier, like if there's a chicken and egg problem, because if you do not know the keys, we, we do not know the, the alignments right, from the beginning, how can we then infer one from another? So in, in IBM models, they use a technique called expectan, expectation maximization, uh, short for EM, which is actually an iterative method to infer the parameters that they need for the model. So basically, you start with some uniform transition, transition probabilities, and then you do a somewhat called a maximization step, uh, and then you do the this step iteratively until it converges. Right. 
it can get pretty complex here. Um, I admit myself that I don't really fully understand this yet because there must there is, there is a lot of calculation like uh, uh, formulas over here. But I think it's it's somewhat very similar to those um, techniques used in reinforcement learning as well. Uh, in case um, for those people who are familiar with it, um, they have like some optimal utility and some optimal policy, right? But at first you do not know this value. So they also use some sort of similar approaches where you just, at the start, you just assign a, a arbitrary value for these uh, two unknown values, and then you do an iterative approach to find the optimal value for both of them. So are you guys all familiar with VM? I'm not. <laughs> But EM is basically an iterative algorithm that has two steps. Uh, so the problem here is you have multiple parameters, like P, N, D, and P, that you need to estimate. How do you estimate all of them? Well, you pick three of them, and you uh, uh, optimize for one, right? And then you say, OK, now that I've uh, got the optimal one for that, I go back and I optimize the other three. Right? So you pick the round robin there's a, a method, uh, just like uh, Gary said, uh, where you have a um, fitness value, right? Uh, usually it's a complexity, some type of an entity based method that measures how good your, your parameters fit the data, right? So you're looking for that fit to optimize how, how good the, the setting of each of these four parameters are. So you can think of this as an iterative algorithm to find a local minimum where the complexity is lower. Which means the data likelihood is the highest. Mm, not really, no. Uh, expectation maximization is really, you can think of it as an uh, unsupervised method of clustering. So when you do clustering, often you use something like EM. Um, so SGD uh, is usually used in a case of trying to optimize the loss function. Here you have a, a, a loss function based on complexity, just the data likelihood of, of the So it's a bit different, yeah. But they're both similar in some type of uh, iterative gradient algorithm to try to optimize the loss function. The key part about EM is that you have these two steps. So one EM algorithm I'm sure you come across is uh, k mean. Does everyone know the Keynes algorithm? Okay, so I'm sure he does, but he's working on that. So um, Keynes just says I, I have some data point and I want to cluster them, right? I say there's five, five clusters, okay? So I, uh, you know, just put five random uh, cluster centroids out in the data field and then I try to optimize their separation and then cohesion within each other. So you have a chance that uh, you can go to Wikipedia, maybe I'll that's a, 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 a canonical example of using k-means and, and another. Well, k-means is a hard version of EM. The, the real way that you think about EM is something called Gaussian mixture model GNM. So if you know GNM, that is the softer probabilistic version of k-means. But k-means is probably the easiest introduction to this type of family of algorithms. Um, basically, when, when you have a bunch of data points, okay, that's just enough to figure out how to talk about it. Okay, let's imagine that's a data point. Alright, so there are three clusters here, but I pretend I don't know them. Alright, and so what we do in K means is just say, let's pretend there are some clusters and then figure out what the clusters are. Right? So I can start off with three random cluster points. So I can initialize these cluster points anyway, right? So here, here, and here. Okay? Right? So those are my three clusters. They don't look very good. So how do I re-estimate these? Well, I calculate each point and see which is the cluster centroid that's closest. Right? So for example, this cluster centroid is closest to, I think, all the points that are here, right? So this will be one cluster. And this uh, I guess this will be the next stuff, and this one will have nothing in mind. Okay? So what happens next? This is your assignment of clusters um, to the center. Okay? Now we want to go to the uh, uh, expectations that I have. Yeah, I always, always 
So what we're going to do is we're going to recompute the centroids based on the quadrants over here, right? So if I look at this centroid, it's not really the same thing, right? Because it should be go somewhere here, right? Okay. And this one over here, probably the center of these two points is somewhere here. Right? Okay. So now I can do this again. I've reapproximated the position of these three centroids. So I'm going to calculate it again. I'm going to say which ones are, are the closest here. And eventually what we'll get this point will move probably somewhere here, and this point will move down here, and then we'll essentially come to the optimal. Okay. So it has these two alternating steps. One is to measure the data likelihood, that means what's the membership of uh, points to a cluster centroid, and one is the location of the centroid, where the best Okay. So um, uh, in EM, we're, we're doing that. Okay. We're doing this. Uh, Reassignment of, of these parameters based on the data, and then trying to optimize the translation based on the translation. For those interested, I think I will share the slides link which I found for this, which are more specifically catered to translation model. Right? I'll put it on slide later. And the last part of the entire SMT is the decoder part. This is the up max part. So basically, this is like a search problem. So basically, given the inputs that we got from the transition model and the language model, we'll be given like a list of possible candidates to choose from, and then we'll want to find out, uh, find the the one with the highest prob probabilities. Uh, as a, no, we use the one with high probability to, to extract the candidate. Right? And I, and really, exhaustive search is really quite infeasible in this case. So usually, people use. Um, Search heuristics such as beam search and QD decoding. Um, this problem is also exists in neural machine, machine translation, which will also be covered later. So I should I should leave it that part up to the next section. So there are a lot of other parts in SMT that I did not cover. So as, as above, so you can get pretty much more complex. But I think if, to summarize, um, these are the short, general shortcomings of SMT: is that the models can get overly complex and there's really a lot of uh, hand design human engineering involved uh, in order for SMT to be effective. And there are also a, a lot of cases where there they may be words that are out of vocabulary. Because imagine if your, your parallel, parallel corporate do not have the text that you see in your training data, and if you get to see unseen words, uh, the model won't be able to cater to that. And um, also, the components are in, independently trained as opposed to the uh, how training was done in neural machine translation, where it's end to end, so that there's not much synergy involved during the training step between the between the components, and it's also quite memory intensive as the uh, decoders really rely on really huge lookup tables to select the most possible candidates given uh, a foreign language text. So it's not really mobile tech friendly, uh, where the mobile phone has limited memory and also limited internet <coughs> bandwidth. So it's not really that useful for uh, that kind of purposes. So next, I think I should pass on to my next presenter, which will look into NMT and how NMT managed to solve this shortcoming. Right, thank you. Okay, before any questions, right. thanks. So before we get started with the next part, I think it's also important to give some background for the machine translation. So um, if you look at the translation literature, they always refer to the uh, machine translation swimming pool. So I don't know whether you've seen this diagram, but it helps um, to give some background. So this is a picture of a swimming pool. Okay, so you have your source language on this side and your target language on this side. And sometimes you always see this as, uh, for whatever um, historical reason, Target language is uh, uh, E and Okay? And um, this, um, this vertical axis is talking about the level of meaning or a semantic representation um, that people have. So when, when people first thought about translation, they always thought, okay, well, we have some internal representation of language that's sort of independent of language. Somehow our neurons. You think about the same things whether you're 
hear one language or another. So we call that interlingua, right? So some um, intermediate representation before language. And so when you think about interlingua as being at the top here. And here, down here, you would have what? The actual language that we use, right? Uh, so uh, for example, French would be at this corner, English would be at that corner. Now when you do machine translation, you have a choice of getting from one side of the swimming pool to the other. That's not objective, right? So there are a number of different ways that you can do it. When machine translation first started off, they thought they would do this, right? Does this make sense? That you have some type of logical form of what you're trying to express, right? And then when you hear something, you somehow decompile it into a logical form. It sticks in your brain. And then when you want to translate it out, you do a generative process to spit it out in a new language. So this whole idea of, uh, if you look at linguistics, Chomsky and uh, notation, and, and uh, you know, what about uh, uh, context-free languages, context-sensitive languages, it's all about this part here. About what, what types of parameters can humans realize in language? If you've taken any linguistic courses before, you may know about Chomsky and idea uh, that says that as a human being, when you're born, you can only manifest a certain set of languages. There's certain things that uh, could be computationally feasible for a language to be like, but because we are human, binded by the human condition, certain things don't happen. Like, we don't have word salad. You know, there, there's a certain configuration of a word order that's admissible for most human languages. Okay? So that's interlingua. So when people first started in artificial intelligence and machine translation, they were always thinking about this. And as time went by, we got farther and farther down. And now we're at the neuro, you know, we're probably pretty much close to here, you know, just basically from one language directly to the other language, don't need to think about it, right? And, and I, I think now, you know, machine translation is trying to go back up the swimming pool, you know, have more complex representation of what's going on, okay? So uh, there's various levels of this, so you can say, okay, well, I have words, right? I have uh, grammar, you know, I have... Uh, semantic rule, okay? And at, at any point, you can say, okay, I'm going to take this, I'm going to compile it into a bunch of words, then these words are going to be translated to a, a language model, which we just learned. Uh, sorry, a translation model, and then the translation model will go back to the language, right? But there are other ones that have been tried before. So maybe you want to decompile things into a logical form, or a, a parse tree, and then translate it again. So, uh, just for historical reasons, I would like you to be familiar with this analogy of the empty swimming pool. So um, a number of scholars have talked about it in their historical works. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Mikash. I will talk about neural machine translation. Uh, so what exactly is neural machine translation? There's a way to do machine translation using a single learning network where you can do end-to-end -end learning. And the type of network arch architecture used for this machine translation is called sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. So this is an example of the simplest form of a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, where you have two parts, where an encoder and a decoder. So you have your word vectors, your hidden units, and then uh, you have your decoder. This is the uh, set of equations for the simplest form of uh, because to see models, you have encoder and decoder both sharing the weights, and uh, the, for the decoding, you have your softmax function, which gets the maximum probable word from the vocabulary, and then, then you try to minimize the percentage loss for all the target words conditioned on the source. So, what are the issues with this simplest form of model? One definitely is we are sharing the weights for encoder and decoder, which could easily be fixed having different weights for encoder and decoder. The other issue here is uh, the decoder could actually keep on generating the same word again and again, which is higher probably. So what are the ways to fix that? So instead of uh, when we decode with just the previous hidden unit, we could also pass on the word which is generated previously 
So the model knows that this word is already generated. And also the hidden state of the, the, the last hidden state of the encoded model. So this is another representation of the tree where you have your encoder and the last hidden state of the encoder uh, goes as an input to your encoder along with the previous generated word and the previous encoder to the encoder. So what are the other ways we can improve these? And we have seen the prior lectures when we studied about uh, the gated recurrent units, GRU and LSTM, where you can actually stack them and also uh, make them deeper. So this is another potential way of improving the model. And also one of the cool tricks is if you train in a reverse sequence where the encoder takes the words in a reverse sequence with the decoder, uh, what happens in this case is since the, the word uh, which is supposed to be decoded first uh, is closest to the decoder. So the gradients, when they flow, there is a less loss uh, in this case. So it improves the accuracy. Obviously, in this uh, model which I described here, uh, you can uh, switch to the more complex even gated units which we studied earlier. This is going to improve the model. So in this case, when uh, how does the decoder generate the target word? So one of the ways is to use 3D decoding, which we also saw in, uh, in the previous statistical machine translation, where you take the argmax of the, the softmax probability output, and that is your uh, most probable decoder word. So what are the issues which can happen if you do a greedy decoding? So one of the problems is you can never go back and correct your decision. Since once that generated, you will go to the next one. Uh, so one of the ways to improve uh, this is obviously being search. Uh, it's not ideal solution because uh, ideally you would like to explore all possibilities of, of, of the target uh, decoding, but it's not possible because it's too expensive to do. So, as you can have a fixed beam size, a 5 or 10, which is quite good in practice, and then keep track of the most probable translation, uh, and, and the most probable translation will be actually. Uh, so, in this case, uh, uh, this model uh, is a uh, a translation between a language A and a language B. Uh, how do we do multilingual translation where you could translate from one language to any other language? So one of the uh, ways is to have m more than such models where you can train them independently. Other way is to share the decoding part uh, uh, or share the encoding part. So Google came up with their uh, machine translation model, I think in 2015, uh, where they, they were able to train one single model which could translate from any source language to any target language. Uh, so one of the advantages of this approach, uh, they also observed that for some language pairs, for example, it's Korean and English, there are less examples. Training uh, such a model improved the accuracy of translation from uh, source language targets that has less corpus. Uh, also, uh, they were able to show that you could do a zero-shot translation. That means even if you have not seen a particular language, you could use, uh, you could translate source language to the target language. So, so please try to relate this slide to the experience for Nigeria. I, uh, they're, they're very well in fact, that one of the scientists who made this model came from my group. He graduated uh, about eight years ago, and so this is the example. So he's now a deep mind, but he, he started in the SMT uh, region when he was an undergraduate So, uh, I won't go into a lot of detail about this architecture, but uh, basically they use uh, 
LSTM with attention. Uh, Nick is going to talk about attention later. So wh why, why did uh, neural machine translation do better uh, than the statistical machine translation as we said earlier? One of the more, most important advantages is you could do an end-to-end -end learning. Uh, also, the distributed representation which we studied in earlier lectures uh, helped in improving the accuracy. Uh, uh, neural machine uh, translation models are better able to exploit context and also generate more fluent text. So, is, is this uh, solved? I mean, is this neural machine translation able to solve all the issues? So one of the major issues which you saw earlier were out of vocabulary words, you're not able to keep out. So let's say the, the, the source sentence has a word which is, it's not in our uh, vocabulary. It's impossible for the model to generate that during translation. Uh, also the domain mismatch issue, but uh, we have seen the earlier example that the human machine translation is able to translate from unknown source language to uh, private language. Uh, maintaining context, obviously, we have seen in earlier lectures how the, the, the gradient issue happens if you have a, a very uh, large text. And also, obviously, the process. So, one of the solutions to the zero short word prediction is something called using pointers, where what this basically does is uh, you could either choose a decoded word from your vocabulary or pick from the source itself. So for example, in this sentence, Fred, Chair, Janet, Yellen, raised weights, most likely this sentence is talking about this word Yellen. But since this is a name, this may not be part of your vocabulary. So this is a more detailed explanation where uh, you could either use the softmax decoding or the beam search, the way we see earlier, or have an additional hidden unit, uh, which then uh, uh, you do an inner product with all the, the source words, and you translate that into a softmax probability, sorry, and then choose whether to spit that word out or use some words from other yeah. 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 So you have an additional hidden unit, which is called Q. Yeah, so you could pick it from the source, the sentence which you are given to translate. So that word Yellen so, uh, is, let's say it's uh, English to French translation. So this is a name, you, and you could think that it's highly likely that it's that word. And since you haven't seen it, you would pick it from the source itself. So you either pick from your vocabulary or from the source. And you could all train end to end, so you'll be able to do it. And Nick uh, now will talk about it. And we got it all clear uh, about the last time, about what the two terms are trying to do. Like, is everyone familiar with the zero stop problem? Do you guys want to define that too much to take a stop? Can I hear I heard a song? What's one shot in the zero shot? When you have a source and then you have a source and then you have a translation of the source, you won't just end up with a translation of the source, you can be one of the different. So the way you have a normal sequence of the source, you set up every time that you decide what you have to do. But now the scalar is not right. Yeah. 
so you can see the two terms there, right? You can see both of those. So zero shot refers to the case where you have basically out of vocabulary, right? Meaning that in the test time you see something you never see before, right? And um, that that's applicable in language, but also in vision. So you may see this a uh, uh, five vision. Like you see a new object, can you distinguish it as a new type of object, not something else, right? So that's always a problem. For example, you take a chair. The idea of a chair. There's so many different forms of chair, right? There are designers who make chairs that don't look like chairs, but you still recognize them as functionally as chairs. But they're still a chair, right? So zero-shot learning has to do with this difficulty. It's like you look at an item or you look at a vocabulary and you know what it is. Like you know that yelling is a last name because of its context. You know chair supports somebody because you sit on it, right? Uh, so even though it doesn't look like a chair because you're sitting on it, then it must be a chair. It doesn't look like a chair, right? So one-shot learning is the other part, right? You, you've seen it only once in training uh, and you have to recognize it. So it used to be pretty challenging to support one-shot learning, but then in the last couple of years, uh, neural networks have been able, through this type of pointer architecture or uh, self-attention, they started to be able to recognize when it is useful to use think at testing time, think, uh, you know, things that they've never seen before, and just predict directly from it. Uh, it's really powerful because in a lot of domains, you know, if you're training it on the thing. Wall Street Journal or standard natural language program, and you're applying it to a domain where it's never been used before, chances are there's a lot of problems with this out of vocabulary, vocabulary mismatch, right? And so the system needs to be able to do zero shot learning as well. That's, of course, as you can imagine, really difficult. But humans have no problem with that, most of the time, right? And if you do, you say, well, what, what terminology are you using, right? You, you, you're a computer scientist and you walk into a bar and people are talking, I don't know, uh, about philosophy. You can clear it. And so another part of zero-shot learning is like knowing that you don't know and that you need to ask, right? So well, what is that term that you're talking about? Is it a person? Is it a place? Is it an organization? Right? Well, what is that object you're holding? In the case of what does it do? What functionality does it Robotics, that's also important. When you see an object, you immediately need to know what you can do with it. Can you grab it? Can you pick it up without squishing it? What type of force do you need to hold onto it? You know, if I pick it up and I rotate it, will things spill out of it? You know, can I put it upside down? Or, you know, all these things we take for granted, even as two-year-old, three-year-old toddlers, we can already figure out certain aspects of, of the real world that a machine has no idea. We have to keep them off. Right. So, for example, you have a long cylindrical object like a pen. How do you pick this up? You don't do it like that, right? You pick it up like this. Why, why do you do that? How do you know that? Right? So, these are the, all the authorities that can come from zero shot learning, like thinking that in mind. Since uh, <coughs> the sequence to sequence model, or sometimes it gets termed as encoder decoder model, is so powerful already. But still, we have some um, techniques to make it even better. So, attention is one of the very powerful techniques. So, for some problem, we have this uh, bottleneck problem when the, um, the source sentence becomes too long. Right? Then we need to encode the, the, the whole source sentence with a fixed length vector. So in this case, I, I put some index to this uh, different he hidden, uh, encoder hidden states, H1 through H4. So all the meaning of the source, so this H4 need to capture all the necessary information of the whole source sentence. And uh, it becomes an information bottleneck when the sentence becomes too long. And so how to solve this uh, bottleneck problem? So I just try to decipher the thinking process. Uh, I think it's a very good problem-solving procedure. So since we only use uh, the, the H4, it becomes a bottleneck. So what if we just use all the encoded hidden states? And the problem will go away. And then we have another problem. If we use all the hidden states, 
then how do we deal with a variable length in percent sequence, right? From sentence to sentence, the, the length could be different. So, what if we do a weighted sum to squash all the, the, the hidden states back to a fixed length vector? We call it context vector. Okay, if we do that, then the variable length problem gets solved. But then, how do we decide this all the weights that get associated to each hidden state? So how do we compute this? So we get to do this in two steps. So the first step, um, given a at a particular uh, decoder time t, we are using the, the, the decoder hidden state and the, and the take let's call it st and we do a dot product with uh, each of the encoder hidden state then we get a score for each of them for this case we'll have four scores then we do a do a softmax of these four scores to make it back to a probability distribution so that can solve this problem of getting the weight so um so the, this last procedure is also give us an alignment. So the, the, the width score give us a very good sense where to align our, our attention to the input word. So there are some questions. So first of all, why would you stop for that? So what's the intuition of a uh, stop for that? Distance. Yeah. Surely correct. It's a uh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's very similar to cosine similarity. Yeah, so it's just a a a weight a, a skilled uh, cosine similarity. So cosine similarity will only uh, consider the, the the angle. But for this case, we we'll we we'll also uh, focus on the the both uh, the angle and the, the the magnitude of the two vectors. Yeah, so this gives us a, a, a sense of uh, similarity measure between these two vectors. And uh, so, but once we use dot for that, we imply that uh, we need the dimension to match the, the dimension of the, the um, encoder hidden state and the dimension of the decoder hidden state. So what if the dimension do not match? So we can see all these, uh, this solution is actually not a magic. Sometimes it's quite natural. So we can use a linear transformation of the some of one of the hidden state, then we use the dot product. So actually this is a, a, a also called general multiplicative attention that we will learn in the next lecture. So here's a, the, a nice flow chart to demonstrate the whole procedure. Um, so we have a source sentence. In this case, I think it's in French in French, and uh, this is uh, the encoder. So once uh, we, we, we want to decode, the, the, we do the, the, the translation of the first word, we use uh, the decoder hidden state and uh, do the dot product as we just described. And we'll do the dot product with regard to each of the uh, encoder hidden state, then we get all the scores, in this case, four scores. Then we do a softbank to compute the attention distribution, so we turn the scores into a probability distribution. And uh, then we do a weighted sum. So this becomes the weight, and so this is uh, the, the original um, hidden state. So the weight, the weighted sum, we get an attention output. So sometimes uh, people call this dynamic context vector because uh, this uh, attention itself depends on the current state of the decoder, so it's dynamic. Okay, then we just, in this case, we concatenate uh, the attention output and the uh, decoder state to, together as an input to, to, to DR, do our decoder, so the rest will be the similar to the previous sequence to sequence model. So here's a, a, another question, why do we use concatenation instead of maybe we just adding them together for the uh, attention of when the, the decoder hidden state? Yes, 
So in this case, probably if the hidden state, uh, the, the, the encoder hidden state and the, out, the decoder hidden state is the same, then we can just add them. There's no problem in terms of the dimension mismatch. But if we use concatenation, then it could be different. So we do this uh, for for all the different state of the decoding, then we get the the the, the whole um, sentence, the output sentence. Another question: How does the decoder state participate in, in this uh, attention mechanism? So actually, we can see it appears twice. First of all, we use uh, the decoder hidden state here to compute the the to, to participate in the dot product for each of the encoder state to com compute the, the attention output and then we can connect this together with the output uh, the decoder hidden state again to to generate out so two times is get participate in the whole process so we show the flow chart now it's a uh, attention equation so it's actually quite simple but powerful. So uh, this is just a recap of what we have just been through. So we have the encoder hidden state, x1 all the way to xn. In case we have like the sequence contents n word in this case. So on time step, time step step t, we have the decoder state st. Um, yeah, for this case, the, the, the dimension is the same. So we get the attention score by by computing the dot product for the uh, using the uh, the decoding hidden state and the each of the encoder hidden state, then we take a softmax to get a, a distribute probabilistic distribution, and uh, we do a weighted sum to get the context vector, and uh, then we can connect them together, and uh, proceed as a normal sequence to sequence um, machine translation model. So. Attention is very helpful, and uh, through all the simulations and uh, the, the practical result, we see that it, it improves the performance a lot, especially uh, when the sentence gets long. And uh, you solve the bottleneck problem, because nowadays we can um, directly look at the, 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 all the individual um, encoders, hidden state, in, and bypass the, the bottleneck of the last hidden state. And uh, it helps with the validation grading problem because we have this nice shortcut. So to update the, the previous hidden state, we do need to travel through all the subsequent encoder hidden states. And uh, it also provides the, in some interpretability. So this go back to the alignment model. So the, the alignment weight shows, in a way, which part of the, 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 the input sequence we are focusing on when we try to do the translation of this current word, and uh, we get this alignment for free, so which is very good. So, me question so far. So, so, well, so, question why? why. <coughs> So why we use uh, well, why we can connect the, the context vector and the, the decoder hidden state instead of maybe just add them together. Um, so if the dimension doesn't match, then we cannot add them together, element-wise summation. If the vector length is different between the uh, this AT, in this case uh, the dimension is edge and uh, um, but here, the, the decoder hidden state, the, the dimension could be different. It's not edge. Then we cannot just add it. It's not just that. So you guys can also try to think about why Length of seconds can be different. Mm -hmm.
I think that's a very good question. I think for the decoder side, it's we take the weaker sum. We get rush back to uh, 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 the, the, the same dimension vector. So the, the, the edge just, the, it's a word embedded in that way defined. So the, this could be constant. But how to implement the, the first part when we try to um, do the, the soft map? Soft map. Yeah. I haven't cooked this, so anyone can help me. That's a bit. I, I think I somehow understand your question. You are not concerned about the edge. You are concerned about the end. Like, um, so, like for different sentence, the num the num yeah. So, I I'm yeah. I'm not sure, but from a practical angle, probably when we input the sentence, it could be different length, but probably we pick the maximum length and do a padding. So make sure the all the input sentence somehow when it's seen by the model it's the same length. So the end will be the same. Um,
So for that one, we will give us an introduction to some of the other sequence to sequence applications. So, uh, sequence and sequence and attention, uh, they are not uh, limited to the task of uh, neural machine translation. It can also be applied to other tasks as well, as you can summarize. So, uh, in my presentation, I'll be uh, briefly discussed uh, about the task of summarization, dialogue system, uh, speech recognition, and image captioning, about how sequence and sequence and attention mechanism has uh, revolutionized the uh, task. So uh, first is about text uh, summarization. So given a text document, our task is to create a summary uh, with much shorter length that can still uh, retain the major points of the original document. So uh, here's an example. Task. So before sequence and sequence, um, people were using um, what we call the extractive uh, topic representation approach. So why is it extractive? Extractive in a sense that uh, you were trying to extract the relevant words and sentence. So then they can form a summary uh, based on that sentence. So it's, it's not in a sense that uh, of the generative. Uh, yeah. So the two most used is probably latent semantic analysis and also uh, the Bayesian topic models uh, with the famous LDA. So an approach would be uh, we run LDA on the whole document to obtain the topic distribution. Uh, then we can run LDA on separate uh, sentences. Then we can compare the topic distribution of each sentence with the overall topic distribution of the whole document. Then we can find uh, the most relevant uh, sentence. And from that, we can compute our summary based on uh, sentences, those sentences. Yeah, so um, these uh, primitive models have certain drawbacks. Uh, the first is that they consider sentences as independent of each other. Uh, and many of these uh, previous uh, text summarization techniques uh, they do not consider semantics of words. So this is like uh, before word embedding, uh, word to back glove, and uh, most of them are uh, in, encoded in one half vectors. And uh, of course, uh, these are like uh, extractive summarization, so the soundness and readability of the generated uh, summaries uh, may not be satisfactory. Yeah. Um, then, uh, then came sequence and sequence, uh, and uh, the test become abstractive. Uh, which means we do not merely select a few existing passages or sentences uh, from a source. So all the, uh, the task of neuro neural machine translation and abstractive text summarization, although they are both sequence to sequence, but there are fundamental differences. Uh, so the first one is that uh, in the task of neural machine translation, uh, the output actually depends on the source length. So we would uh, somehow expect uh, an equivalent uh, length in our output as well. Uh, whereas in the uh, abstract text summarization, we'll expect our output to be much shorter. And uh, in NMT, we also hope to retain the original content, whereas in summarization, we hope to uh, compress the original content, but still uh, concise. And then in uh, NMT, there's this strong notion of one-to-one -one, uh, word level alignment, whereas uh, in summarization, uh, this notion is less obvious. Yes. Um, so uh, we'll survey this uh, particular paper, Abstractive Text Summarization Using Sequence to Sequence and Beyond. So the author actually uh, enriched the encoder features by adding uh, part of speech, uh, name entity recognitions, uh, term frequency, and inverse uh, document frequency. I think this can be uh, very useful indications of whether a word's importance, right, we can include it in our summary. Uh, and of course, also to deal with uh, out of uh, vocabulary words, uh, the user also implement a uh, pointer mixture, which uh, we call a uh, switch generator pointer. Uh, yeah, and um, the author also make use of uh, a second layer of importance. That is, uh, the user apply attention mechanism, but instead of words level, he applied it at the sentence level. So he runs a separate uh, RNN architecture on top of our words at the sentence level. So uh, at the end of each sentence, he obtained a hidden state for each sentence. Yeah, and then he obtained a word level attention is then reweighted uh, when we consider the importance of uh, the sentence itself as well. Yeah. Uh, the next test is a dialogue system. So uh, before we get there, I think it's important to uh, talk a little bit about summarization, the topic that uh, my research is up a lot of. So I, I wanted to also highlight some key problems So um, in summarization, we have two different paradigms. One is 
abstracted summarization, one is abstracted summarization. Abstracted means you generate a new technique, sort of like the swimming pool analogy, right? You, you ingest information, and then when you need to summarize it, you spit it back out. But as, uh, extracted is a lot easier to think about. You, you have a text that stays sentences long, and you want to choose or sort of rank sentences in such a way that you can cut the number of sentences off and come particular with it. And just say, I use n sentences instead of k, where n is much smaller than k, right? Okay. So that's one thing about extractive and abstract. Now, which one of these paradigms is easier to evaluate? Abstractive or extractive? Extractive, right? Because uh, it's something that's comparable. You just need to give a ranking of sentences and then you're done. With abstractive, you're out of luck. You actually have to get team and annotators to tell you whether those things are any good or good. Right? So that's why the movement in abstract summarization has been really, really difficult. For many, many years, you can't do comparable research with abstract summarization. But simply, if you evaluate it again, you get the same It's not as much one key part that's still missing in text summarization is this idea of context. So uh, Huang just now presented the idea of using attention on sentences. But one very powerful thing in summarization that uh, a lot of people do, which was recognized in the 90s, um, is the idea of cut and paste, right? Which means when you, you, you watch actual people who summarize, what do they do? They <coughs> cut and paste various parts of sentences usually now phrases or clauses into uh, a summary and they knit extra content, fit them together. Okay? So right now when we think of extractive summarization, we tend to think of it as a sentence level exercise. You tell me which sentences are there, I choose some of those sentences as a subset and I give it to you. Right? But when we do summarization in reality, we don't do that. We we don't actually select that as a sentence level, as it said as we do. We select that some type of more fine-grained level. So there's some work to be done still, which you will see in the next couple of years, I guarantee you, on doing uh, selection of certain spans of information. So it could be, uh, because we learned uh, parsing, right, in week four, it could be constituent-based things, right? Constituents basically means there's a contiguous subset of a subsequence of words that you just cut out, right, and put in somewhere else. So when we do summarization, many times if you look at a long sentence that has relative clauses, tangential pieces of information, that attribution span, right, like blah, 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 said, you know, the idea of spoken, right? So you just cancel that last part out because that's not important. So when we do that, you can think about uh, doing extraction on these types of clause level information. So that's very important to do. And, and we see actual, we study actual human summarizers, they do these things. So, uh, you know, this is sort of like still very primitive, basic work that's being done. And there's plenty of work that anyone else in this room can do to further this sort of It's not particularly hard to do, you just have to do it. So I think we're in very exciting time with respect to the, the area of research that I'm doing. Yeah. I guess you could also use it in that way. Yeah. Uh, what a, more what we're thinking about is using attention not at the word level but at some type of hierarchical parse level, right? To say that okay. This noun phrase is really important, or this adjective is very important, or this preposition is very important. If you think about laugh with Trump or laugh at Trump, right, the, the preposition is really important, right? So you don't use the right preposition there, the, the meaning is lost, right? But you could use it also in that sense that, you know, I, I have a certain amount of information and I just want to cut off there. Uh, that, that's particularly true for spoken dialogue. Uh, summarization when you have linear constraints from dialogue. So I think Juan is going to talk about uh, you know uh, chat systems. So oh, yes. that's a good question. Uh, 
Ah, yeah. So um, this lecture is getting ready for the next couple of lectures. So when we get the transformer network, we're going to see all this stuff about RNN subscribe to the uh, Because people have figured out that actually, because of all of this gradient problems and back propagation and, and the, uh, the fact that there's a lot of non local context that needs to be preserved, uh, actually the attention model is a much better way of representing long distance dependency than the unrolled RNN. So uh, I, I think we'll get to that soon. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if Kate talked about it again. But it is just a, a high level uh, overview of the paper. But I think in a way that um, this uh, context vector that retained at the sentence level did their job to preserve itself. So uh, even as the document goes on, we still can still preserve the the high level meanings of the sentence at the, with the sentence file. Yes. Uh, any other? But generally, that's a really good question. You know, when you get longer and longer sentences, things get much, much easier. So that, uh, that helps with some type of hierarchical model will 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 lead you to that to some extent. You can see if you have a word level model and your your sentence is fifty words long, that you're going to get degradation right away. If there's no other question, then move on to the class of dialogue system. So uh, speaking about dialogue, uh, Google just rolled out this uh, duplex, uh, Google duplex that helps you uh, make uh, appointment via call. So this is a very uh, promising uh, task of the uh, room of uh, natural language processing. Uh, so before sequence, like the sequence, people were using uh, POMDB, which basically uh, partially observed Markov decision process. So um, yeah, so uh, the overall architecture looks like this. So you have this uh, spoken language understanding unit, which uh, help uh, transform your input text, as uh, input speech, into uh, some semantic representation. Then this, with this semantic representation, the internal state gets updated. Then uh, this policy evaluates the internal states and gives out the appropriate action, which is then reconverted into the system to respond via the natural language generation. Uh, so uh, there are several uh, drawbacks of uh, this dialogue system, such as that they use handcrafted features, and uh, of course they require a large top rough annotated uh, task-specific simulated uh, conversation. And uh, because this is a goal-driven system, so there are like uh, two different systems: the goal-driven one, which are those when you uh, encounter when you're trying for uh, obtain technical support. So when you have a, a fixed goal in mind, uh, what you're gonna achieve after you interact with the system, say for, for the case of Google, then you want to book an appointment. Whereas we also have a non-goal driven system, which is just for like casual uh, chat conversation that may not have any uh, determined goal. Yeah. And uh, of course, because uh, it is very task specific, uh, they require a large corpora, and they, it is very time consuming to deploy. Uh, and sequence to sequence comes, and it helps us uh, provide an end-to-end -end trainable non-goal driven system uh, based on the generative uh, probability model. So um, this uh, dialogue itself also makes use of uh, hierarchical recurrent encoder decoder architectures, which basically at um, each utterance, so utterance is like uh, at each response dialog of each agent, right? Then uh, we compute this uh, context hidden state, and this context hidden state is then pro propagated uh, to time. Yeah, so uh, the current uh, context hidden state is then uh, can be dependent on the current utterance um, representation, also as well as the previous context hidden state. Um, there's also uh, the task of speech recognitions, um, which can be a bit uh, different from uh, our normal sequence to sequence. So if uh, we deal with uh, other type of data other than words, such as uh, audio speeches, then we may expect our input to be continuous instead of uh, this discrete. So RNN can only be trained uh, to make a series of uh, independent oh, yeah. So in, in, in this, uh, so what we're doing with uh, audio sequences is continuous. We will make use of uh, such as uh, time frame 
uh, sampling, which people have uh, a, a small windows of time and sample the inputs from that. And uh, yeah, and RN sometimes you can only be trained to make a series of uh, independent label classification. Uh, this is actually RNN, which is not sequence to sequence. So as we move to sequence to sequence, then the series of uh, label classification can be independent, can be dependent of each other. Yeah. So here are some of the representative architecture of uh, speech recognition, uh, the CPC, uh, the RNN uh, transducer, uh, the attention. Uh, which uh, this is the architecture with uh, attention and decoder. So at the latest one, uh, this one actually make use of both the pre-attention weighted um, hidden state as well as uh, the one that uh, has uh, the hidden state weighted with attention into our joint network to predict the outputs of the speech recognition. And come to the task of uh, image captioning. So uh, this is a very uh, familiar architecture. So basically, we have uh, we still re retain the traditional encoder decoder architecture, but instead of having an RNN as our encoder, we use uh, a CNN, a convolutional neural network. So attention can all also be applied uh, in the CNN itself, so that the network can learn to pay attention to different parts of the image uh, as in here. So I think we have this link open. I'm um, sure you can uh, see it, but uh, this one is quite clear. So um, the model is trying to generate the image caption from uh, the caption from this image. And uh, when the next words, it's uh, say a man holding a tennis racket, then tennis racket, then uh, the image of a tennis racket actually shines, which means the model actually learns to pay attention onto this uh, particular part of the image. So this is a very uh, nice mechanism in the sense that uh, we used to perceive neural networks as, uh, as black boxes, but uh, with attention itself, then maybe uh, there's another mechanism for us to actually understand uh, what's going on inside our, the neural network itself and uh, what elements that is leading to the whole uh, decision-making process uh, inside our neural network. Uh, so with that, I uh, conclude uh, our group presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. Okay, so we're done for today. Uh, next week we'll have our uh, week seven group, and we'll have to say goodbye to the first half of the class, uh, which is uh, all the PhD students uh, doing this for credit. Um, next week we will also be returning to Obara. I've already called them in the so uh, I hope uh, those of you who like to socialize you know, have a wonderful part of academia also um, that uh, you do join us over there. So you can tell us about the Okay, so thank you everyone. Um, keep back to your project. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I know some of you have put down your projects a little bit late. I will try to give you some small notional com uh, comments on that. But uh, I think it's very helpful to do the project proposal early because I can see there's a lot of synergies with many people in the, uh, in the course of one of these things. Okay. So thank you very much. See you guys next week.